Good afternoon. Welcome back to the second part of our symposium, Constructing Practice. It's a pleasure for me to introduce the guest speakers of our third panel, entitled Collaborative, From Collective to Transdisciplinary, which brings together three practices that have formulated and tested alternative forms of collaboration within the practice itself and across other fields and practices. We are delighted to be joined by the following guest speakers. Laurel Broughton from Welcome Projects, LA. Susanne Eliasson and Anthony Jam from Grau, Paris. And Guillermo Lopez from Mayo, Barcelona. Andres Kake from GSAP will moderate the session. Please join me welcoming Laurel Broughton, our first speaker. Switch the slides. We just. Um, which one? Should be. I know. Um, this one. Okay, perfect. 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 One just... Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first off, um, thank you to um, Juan and Enrique and Amal and the whole um, Colombia team for putting this whole day together. It's the, I found the morning panel to be sort of emotional watching all of these practices sort of divulge, uh, divulge their, um, their sort of inner workings and, and secrets. Um, um, so I'm going to be, um, I think of it sort of more as telling a story here. Um, and so I want to welcome you to Los Angeles. Um, it doesn't rain in Los Angeles very much. Um, so our umbrellas have become useful things or useful tools for other things. Um, as an icon, the umbrella appears over and over again, in this case as a kind of graphic or part of a um, uh, cute branding pun. Uh, pun. Um, it appears as a uh, magical instrument in children's stories um, or as an object that conceals the potential of some sort of conspiracy um, such as with Josiah Thompson's uh, Umbrella Man um, or as a kind of semantic prop um, in the annals of surrealism, as Magritte might say, it's simultaneously playing here as both a repeller and concealer. Um, or as a flexible, transient architecture, as in this 1955 uh, photo uh, by Rene Burry of a woman in front of a Ronchamp underneath an umbrella. For us, though, it is the umbrella's capacity to gather and to protect that has provided a useful way to think about how to formulate a practice, and particularly one that meanders um, through traditional disciplines. And so Welcome Projects um, is just that. It's an umbrella that holds what can at times seem like very disparate work together. Through all of it, it is the binding interest um, to explore our relationships to the things around us and how we can see and interact with them in different and potentially new ways. Our work oscillates between ideas or architectures or utilitarian objects. And I'm going to use the umbrella as it appears in a handful of projects as a sort of subterfuge, if you haven't picked up on that already, um, to talk about the types of work we do and how we practice. So The Village was a series of drawings that was published in Zing Magazine in 2012. Um, in them, they, there is developed a small urban enclave um, constructed from everyday objects. The sort of self-inflicted requirements of this enclave were that there would be a civic building, a big box store, a strip mall, 
housing of several economic classes, a recreation facility, a museum, and an office complex. Elaborating on some of those programs, the bowler hat became the villa, the cordless phone, a high-rise apartment building, the makeup compact becomes a multi-level gym with a swimming pool, the open book, a trust structured big box store, and finally, an umbrella, which becomes a museum with a rotating restaurant at the top. Each object stays simultaneously itself while becoming something else. This last September, I was invited to contribute to the annual architecture and design issue of the magazine Art Papers. And this issue, um, the theme was swimming pools, and not just any swimming pools, but swimming pools in Los Angeles, a la this famous David Hockney classic. I sent them this big conceptual idea they responded, ha, no, we're not dipping our magazines in swimming pools. Um, so if they didn't like the wet magazine, then what about a dry one? But like the sort of soppy mess before, a magazine in a clear, -shaped, in a clear pool shaped bag was dismissed quickly on logistical grounds. But I continued doodling. And what is useful about the doodle as a practice is that it is the agent of double seeing, upside down, backwards, and in between. The poodle, as I came to think of them, is a daydream. They exist somewhere between a common word um, and a shape. A poodle associates freely are made of colored pencils and pen. And some 30 poodles later, I submitted what I suggested might be marginalia, tiny and pop-up scattered throughout the issue. And unlike most things that would be included in that issue, like scholarly essays or slickly designed pool projects, I figured that they would be oddly ragged, maybe stupid, imprecise, and made by hand. I also figured there might be a good chance the editors would say no. Um, when I went to my mailbox in this, this spring, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the poodles had become the cover stars of the issue. In Shed House um, in Malibu, California, which was a collaboration with Michael Boyd, we jump in scale from the doodling of swimming pools to the design of actual swimming pools and the houses that go with them. We were approached by a client who wanted the Southern California fantasy of modernism, but they wanted it new. And so the party of the house is um, essentially two shed figures that are rotated perpendicularly against each other and to form a kind of T plan. Completed in 2016, um, these photographs were taken after the clients had moved in, um, and the, the interiors were obviously completed. This is the intersection of the two sheds, which forms an open, uh, continuous living and entertaining space. Um, and then at this, the extents of the shed figures are more contained spaces for reading and sleeping, but my favorite images of the house are the ones we took before the interiors were completed, capturing the house suspended in a moment where it could be a stage for almost anything to happen. The three bears might be waiting for you in the kitchen for some porridge, um, or you might have just missed Alice um, as she rushed in to get her bathing suit at the point at which on the interior where the two sheds meet. 
And so practicing under a kind of umbrella allows for a finished building to be an instrument for storytelling in ways that architecture might typically shy away from. In 2009, like most of my friends and colleagues and a few people um, earlier in the morning, um, I found myself um, at, amidst the Great Recession um, and unemployed. And it was during this time that I began a project that depending on context is the one that we are probably most well known for. Um, Welcome Companions was a line of objects and accessories. This is the first Welcome Companion that we produced, wagon number one. Um, it was produced originally in a very limited edition, i.e. made by me. I'm also standing in that photograph. <laughs> um, a, a, a very limited edition essentially meaning a series of, of one-offs and eventually placed in several shops um, in Los Angeles and in New York. And everyone who saw the wagon called it a puppy. And it was quickly published um, in a series of different places, but in particular Newsweek. And it was its publication in Newsweek, which I think actually doesn't even exist anymore as a magazine, um, <laughs> which, which led to the making, um, which led to a kind of practice where the actual physical making of ideas um, into useful objects could be a viable option. And so the project of Welcome Companions today is comprised of 14 collections. Each reinterprets everyday objects and accessories to tell stories. We seek to inject a sense of play and suspense into the objects we interact with and depend on on a daily basis. And to suggest the novelty that function isn't wholly dependent on utilitarian form. Welcome Companions are produced in limited editions in Los Angeles, and the umbrella even reappears as part of our logo mark. And they've been featured in publications, including the New York Times, Vogue, Paper Magazine, and they've been sold in boutiques um, globally. And of course, we sell them on our website, in our web shop at welcomecompanions.com. And our smallest umbrella was produced as part of a sticker sheet that was commissioned originally by Urban Outfitters. But the umbrella has also appeared as a real object in our work, um, uh, as used as a kind of building material in gallery, um, in gallery attachment, which was a project uh, done in collaboration with Andrew Kovacs. Um, which was sponsored by the Storefront for Art and Architecture and the Los Angeles Forum for Architecture and Urban Design, um, where composites of multiple objects, the umbrella being one of them, are constructed and arranged to become a kind of field of play or intervention in a parking lot in Chinatown. And then, as a few of us here today were, we were invited to participate in this year's Chicago Architecture Biennial Make New History. The request was a model um, of a photograph of an architectural interior to be included in a room which was called Horizontal City Room of Plinths. We chose a pair of photographs of Le Corbusier's brief flirtation with surrealism, the Bastigli apartment. And what has always been fascinating about the Bastigli is how the design conceals what would be an unobstructive view of the Parisian skyline. The high garden walls blocking all but the largest urban monuments, the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower. But oddly, in blocking them, it also scales them to small objects. In our model, a magic shift occurs with the suddenly small urban landmarks resting on the walls above a new urbanity of objects, a top hat, a cordless telephone, and an umbrella, among others, making a new city below. But for us, an architectural model is never simply an end in and of itself. Each of the wooden objects has a dual life, 
first as a building and then as a prototype for a collection of toys. Taken out of the city, each object can be disassembled, mixed up, and reassembled into endless configurations and odd combinations. The toy set will eventually be produced under Welcome Companions as yet another category of object that will go out into the world. And then to finish, we recently moved our studio from this building, and I'm sort of sad to see this illustration go because the building inside the building inside the building seems to be a good way to sum up our practice um, as always being in search for a kind of multiplicity in how architecture and design can be in the world. Thank you. Suzanne Eliasson and uh, Anthony Jam. Too close. Thank you very much for this um, invitation. It's a pleasure to be, um, to be here. Um, so GROW is an office of urbanism and architecture based in um, Paris um, and um, um, founded in seven, seven, seven years ago. We start the office um, with four people and we have in common the fact that we were student of um, a French um, urbanist, which is uh, Jamel Clouche, and we work in, in his office, which is, the name is um, LAUC. And um, we start the, the office with the idea to create a collective intelligence. It means that uh, the sum of the group is superior as, the, as the each um, individual. And we uh, choose a name for our office. Uh, it was Grau. And um, Grau means gray in German. Uh, gray is not completely uh, black. It's not completely white. It's something in between. And uh, in between, it's quite uh, large. And in, the, in this sense, gray is a metaphor of the place where we work. It means the, the contemporary city, uh, sort of suburban city, um, more or less uh, weak, more or less uh, disconnected, uh, monofunctional, but we always work in a metropolitan um, aspiration. It is within this metropolitan condition that we speculate. I think it's, um, it's important for us to say also that Constructing and building a practice is um, is also an economical project. Uh, we are, uh, I think, we're quite fortunate uh, coming from middle class families in the Western world, but we don't have the luxury to not need to work, and uh, we don't have the network for work to to come to us. So we do speculate um, in order to get work, but we try to speculate, um, keeping in mind the subject, which is uh, uh, which is our interest, and and the subject that we are concerned with within our profession is housing. Um, it relates a little bit to our background. Certainly we come from, um, we studied, we both studied in Versailles uh, and uh, uh, with Jamil Clouche. Uh, I studied for a year in Chicago, looked at social housing, the Robert Taylor homes, etc. And we have uh, always wanted with our practice and, and with the work ever since we were, we graduated to um, deal with the spatial and the social conditions. And for us, housing is, let's say, the programmatic aspect which uh, allows us to do that because we look at housing as something that relates to uh, the urban condition. Um, and this drawing shows, um, I would say, the, the main focus of our office and the objective that we have in the everyday, uh, in our everyday practice is making city with housing. Um, as I said, it relates to the idea that housing is a reflection of the city and it, it's uh, uh, even in weaker urban environments, housing always relates to an urban condition. But it's also in the time that we operate, um, starting the office in 2010, uh, it's also a societal and a, and a political challenge. Um, we operate in, in Europe and um, uh, 
in Europe, we were able, at least in France in the 90s, in the early 2000s, we were making mixed-use neighborhoods, urban renewal projects, and now there is a housing crisis, uh, quite large in France, uh, enormous in Sweden, which we know also quite well, and this requires us today to build large amount of housing. Uh, it's often in monofunctional settings, uh, and so the question of how you can make an urban environment, how you can make city with housing uh, is a real um, problematic question for us. Uh, so how do we do that and how do we relate to that in our work? Well, the first aspect for us is um, to look at uh, what it is to live, what is housing today from within housing. And we think we're in a very interesting time today for that because the role of housing is shifting, according to us. Uh, shifting because of the family composition is shifting, because relationships between uh, uh, the private environment, uh, work, leisure, etc., is blurring. Um, and, and all these aspects, technology also is, is uh, allowing us to deal with more shared spaces. And so the, the role of housing is shifting, but it's also becoming for us a, a more central role in the urban environment. It's a place where sometimes you work, you spend more time, and it becomes essential. So that's a first aspect. But it also, to us, it relates to uh, the issue of form. Um, because from the moment that you have to build large amounts of housing, the, the, the form that, that, the urban form that we produce um, is an issue in itself also. And that is something that we feel is very little discussed, at least in Europe and in France. Uh, but it has an impact on how we shape our cities. So the, the relationship between the urban form and the housing from within and how we live is, is essential to us and that's something that we deal with in every project. Uh, to work, we have um, a set of methods that we that we use. Uh, for example, we work a lot with references. Um, it's important to us here. You see a lot of um, housing typologies that are existing projects by other architects uh, that we have redrawn and that we use uh, as a tool when we work. We look at the, we draw them and then we look at how they can produce uh, apply to different territories. How they can produce continuity relationships on the urban scale. Um, and that's an important way of how we work. We have a typological toolbox that we keep uh, adding on to, and of course then certain typologies relate to specific climatic conditions or, or cultural ones. You, it's not something that we can just pick and <coughs> put on the, the map, but it's something that we work with. And we also work a lot with colors. Um, color is a tool for us, very important. It's not a matter about of aesthetical concerns, it's more about how we can express and have a common language. Um, we use a color code, of course green relates to nature, but for example we use blue every time we speak about economical activities, and we use red for housing. Um, it helps us, housing in a model, uh, in drawings, in plants, everything. It helps us within the office to have um, uh, common language and to discuss things easier, but it's also a choice to put red on housing because it puts the urgency, uh, it highlights the urgency of the question for us and, and our main focus. And all this motivation question, our um, role within the profession um, and the link between architecture and urbanism. Uh, we are not only architects within the site and we are not uh, just urban planners dealing with the master plan, we work on the link between these two. Um, we work both for the public sector and the developers, and for us, it's really not the same way of working. Um, when we work with the public, we try to, um, to, to push them to go from, from the urban scale to the uh, typology, to the quality of housing. And when we work with developers, we also try to uh, to force them to go beyond the limit of the site of their building and to try to make connection with the environment. And this, this is a sort of um, zoom in and zoom out method. For us, this method is a, a way to imagine um, how to produce an architecture of today. It means connected with the environment and how to um, imagine um, a more pragmatic uh, urban planning um, based also on um, uh, architectural uh, realities. And this is, for example, um, uh, a commission we did for the public sector for the uh, city of Bordeaux, southwest of France. It's a five-year uh, project that we did with uh, landscape architects um, Claire and Michel uh, Courajou in Coderon, where um, 45,000 uh, people live. The task was to guide the city on the evolution of this existing neighborhood, where there is a strong life uh, 
quality here, but uh, an, an unclear suburban uh, condition. And this uh, lack of understanding and uh, vision um, creates a lot of conflicts. It means that um, uh, projects are systematically um, blocked, uh, even if there is a strong need and demand for housing here. And to clarify this, um, I will say, bazaar, we identify four existing uh, urban fabric. The first one is um, individual urban fabric with villa, swimming pool, and uh, private garden. The second one is uh, um, big re um, collective urban fabric with residents and big uh, trees. The third one is a sort of mixed urban fabric. And the last one is, is um, a shop, which is um, traditional uh, urban fabric in, uh, in Bordeaux. And the, the, the goal of the project was uh, to uh, uh, radicalize and optimize um, each of his um, um, uh, urban, uh, urban, fa urban fabric in introducing new housing typology ad adapted to each of one. And for example, if we take the individual one, um, the idea is that we can make something um, denser uh, without, lose, without losing uh, its individual qualities and uh, um, natural qualities. And for that, we started um, sort of research at the office um, on this kind of housing. And uh, for that, we came to uh, Phoenix in Arizona to visit some project by uh, Alfred uh, Biddle he did uh, during the, the 60s. He has built several projects that create a proximity between individual housing and the natural environment in a, in a strong, gray, uh, strong, strong way. And everything is uh, connected with a um, structural grid and the grid is connected to the streets, so to the public domain. And um, this, is, this picture is a um, case to the apartment he did um, during the 60s, and it's a three-unit apartment. And following this uh, system, he developed other projects. Uh, here it's a plan of uh, three fountain apartments. Uh, it contains uh, 59 uh, um, apartments. We've also, uh, it's, um, there is a very strong grid which is connected to the public system uh, also. And um, it, it is a, re a reference that we, we push a little bit. And then when we come back to, to, to Bordeaux, we discuss with the, um, with the city and to, with the, also the developers um, about the potential of this uh, individual urban fabric. And one of them uh, asked us to um, um, test a sort of prototype in Bordeaux. And the question was uh, how to um, replace one house by 15 uh, dwellings. So I think um, this very short uh, development of a project which has been going on for five years doesn't allow you to understand a project, but maybe to understand, uh, let's say, the relationship that we seek uh, in each project that we work with uh, between the architectural typology, and when we say typology, it's, let's say, the, the interior plan, uh, the living qualities of housing, and the relationship that it, that it has with, uh, with urban fabric. Uh, it is something that we use when we work on um, optimizing existing conditions because we work on uh, um, projects, existing sites where there are issues of densification, but it's also something that we work with uh, when we start from scratch. We're not going to go into this project, but just to give you an illustration, uh, this is the kind of reversed approach. This is a work for a private developer, um, and so the private developer, uh, it's, it's, it's called Vasakronan, it's a Swedish developer, um, wants to build 6,000 new dwellings uh, on a natural setting. Um, and an urban uh, natural land that is empty today. Um, and the, the idea behind building 6,000 dwelling for the developer is not uh, the idea to create an urban condition. It's just because on this site there is a closed subway station. And in order for the city to open the subway station, they need 6,000 people dwelling. So about 13, 14,000 people here. So it's an economical uh, issue for the developer. Um, but we worked with. Um, on exactly in the same way, I would say, as, an, as in Côte d'Iron and Bordeaux, we worked with starting from the living conditions that are uh, the objective, starting from the architectural typology, working on prototypes 
of urban fabric that can that can be produced and that can create uh, urban condition. As it, the thing you look at here is you see the blue as economic activity. It's it's of course it's a, a diagrammatic simplification of it. But what's interesting for us in this scale uh, is that it uh, when we speak about urban fabric, it's that it's not only about the spatial, the physical environment, but also what goes into it. And so for for this project, for example, we work with other architects, Swedish architect. We work with landscape architects also. We worked with a climate engineer who put in all their experts expertise into how this fabric uh, can appear in Sweden in the climatic conditions. Um, and we work with transportation engineers, for example, who, who worked on, we worked on the street system and how it, how it evolves in, in the future and how, how the urban uh, space should look like. And so all these conditions, and then you add the, the issue of affordability for housing, all these conditions come together in something that is, in the end, physical. It's a form, but this form has has meaning. And this is the way we work in a lot of projects. We also redraw existing um, urban conditions, uh, and we draw them on this scale because we feel that this is, uh, from trial and error, we feel that this is a scale that really helps us relate to this. And uh, making city with housing this issue that concerns us, for us, and working on this urban fabric scale is also our kind of, of answer to um, the issue of sustainability and more, I would say, resilience, but to the, the fact that we need, um, uh, I was put off by the fact that we only have one minute left to speak, but it's enough, we're finished. Uh, I'm going to try to get back to what I wanted to say, resilience. Um, it's it's our, our answer to re resilience also, is how this relates to the urban fabric and how designing for change also is designing urban structures uh, that are able to, to support resilience. And just to conclude, we wanted to show you this quote by Ian McHarg, uh, who sums up really well uh, this relationship that we deal with between uh, the housing and, and the urban form, and who is a huge reference for us. So I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, form and process are indivisible aspect of a single phenomenon. There is no such thing as an abstract form. There is no such thing as a capricious form or unmeaningful form. Form and process are indivisible. If one wishes to describe an atom, molecule, crystal, or compound, one can describe it only in formal terms. If one wishes to describe a cell, tissue, organ, organism, or ecosystem, one can do so only in formal terms. All form is meaningful. Thank you. Our last uh, speaker, Guillermo Lopez from Mayo. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Guillermo Lopez. I'm, I'm uh, here on behalf, behalf of Mayo, an architectural office based in Barcelona, and, uh, okay. based in Barcelona and uh, run by four members. Uh, for partners. First of all, I wanted to thank, uh, of course, Juan and uh, Enrique for inviting us here today, and of course, uh, GSAPP for making it possible. Uh, I want to start this, this short lecture uh, with, with an image that, in our opinion, embodies pretty well the way we understand architecture. And uh, even if uh, we don't see anything here, uh, this is a work of art of Michael Asher. He was commissioned in uh, 1974 um, to an exhibition in Claire Cooper Gallery in LA. And uh, what he did instead of producing a set of objects or sculptures uh, was, uh, in fact, removing a wall. He removed the wall that would divide the um, private parts of the offices from the public part that would host the exhibitions. So what is uh, thing that is interesting for us is that, uh, in this case, architecture uh, or an architectural action uh, can become uh, significant. This, uh, let's say, has implications. No architecture, architectural justice neutral. Uh, of course, that uh, Asher's lesson was for us important when we started uh, with our very first project, which was the design of our uh, own studio. Uh, this this uh, studio is in uh, was in no, is is in a in a uh, 40 meter long uh, building existing in Barcelona. So what we did, uh, of course, the first thing uh, we were really aware that the way we designed this uh, project 
was the way uh, we were design, designing our own practice. So we could not detach the way we thought of our, of our practice from this space. What we did uh, in this space, which was almost in ruins, uh, with no windows, and uh, of course very divided, um, because of that it was kind of cheap, I have to say, uh, was opening uh, uh, an, an exterior room in the middle, so we divided this, this space into parts, uh, into a public part related uh, with the street, this one. Uh, this was the patio. So this, this poly part and the rear part where we work. In the front part, of course, we have uh, meeting rooms and so on, but we also have a, a, a small gallery. I bet this is the smallest gallery in the world. It's like three square meters. And we run it together with a designer, uh, Kuro Claret, and with a curator called Moritz Kung. He was a former director of the single, and he's now living in Barcelona. So we run uh, all the three of us, this, this small gallery. And uh, for, it's been important for us because uh, we're really uh, engaged in some processes of art and design that I wanted to take into architecture. Um, while in the front part we have this gallery in the, in the back, in the rear part, uh, that's where we work. And what we did was designing a 12 meter long table and uh, uh, where we work in a kind of horizontal, non-hierarchical way. So uh, bef it's important to understand that before doing this project, we gather together with a lot of people uh, from other disciplines I have to say mostly friends, to graphic designers, to building surveyors, uh, landscape architects, and interior designer. So um, since we were in the middle of a savage crisis in Spain, uh, we needed a very flexible structure. And uh, that allowed us to increase and decrease. So depending on the project, we can work on our own, or we can uh, engage the whole table uh, to do something. Uh, this light structure, I bet, that uh, allow us to survive for, during all these years. and. Uh, the important thing is that, uh, and I will talk a lot about this during this lecture, is that uh, we created a format, a format for our practice. And uh, of course, we've been working with this, with this idea of formats, not just uh, in our practice, but also in our projects. This is the first uh, competition we won in 2012. Uh, of course, we had work before together, but very punctually. So we started as an office in 2012. I mean, a serious office or something like that. <laughs> So uh, this was the plot. It was a huge plot. Uh, due to the crisis in Barcelona, there were a lot of plots that were empty, uh, waiting to be built. And uh, we had to propose a kind of ephemeral urbanism. So the plot was huge, like 3,000 square meters. And we had a ridiculous budget. So what we decided, uh, instead of doing a, a, a project, was uh, designing uh, some structures of use uh, to design, again, a format uh, in order to um, to allow things to happen. So in, in, we did not draw even a plan. We just could write in a sheet of paper some rules, a set of rules that could be applied. So what we did was uh, spending the most, of the most of the budget in creating a very light infrastructure with a lighting system, which allowed the, not to close the space. So it was, could be open 24 seven. And um, then we created that grid that allowed it, uh, a lot of things to happen afterwards. Of course, we were working with this idea of unfinish it. And uh, it was kind of problematic. We really like it, but uh, what, did, what did happened is that people is not used to unfinished projects. So we appeared in all the newspapers in Barcelona as the creators of the ugliest uh, square of the city. Of course, we were really happy being the most at something, even if it's in ugliness, it's super good for your first project. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the provocation uh, worked, and what we uh, achieved was that uh, this, the project has started to grow. So you, we just set the conditions, and everything started to happen. All these layers start to come according to the needs of the of the neighbors and of the area, and finally got uh, made. But of course, uh, we don't uh, use this idea of formats just uh, in build projects. Uh, We've also been involved with edition and publishing, and uh, we were the editors. Uh, in fact, we were here some years ago explaining precisely the format of this magazine. And it's been for us important to apply this idea of format to everything we do. Even uh, uh, this magazine, we, which had a very clear structure, which, which, which was really good for narratives, to write narratives. Or um, 
Uh, of course, we do, as a practice, we do not understand theory detached from practice, and we think of both as a whole. So this is one of the uh, researches that is uh, ongoing in the, in the office. Of course, it's led by Anna Puchane, but more and more it's starting to occupy the, the, the whole office. And uh, when she started to research about, uh, it started in New York, precisely, and she started to, to uh, investigate on the Waldorf Astoria, which is a... Uh, according to Rem Kulhas, an extraordinary building. But uh, she, uh, of course it is, but uh, she realized that behind it there was a net of hidden, uh, yet uh, very extensive uh, net of this kind of ordinary buildings that were uh, working the same, the same way. So uh, we uh, kind of learned kind of three, uh, three ideas which uh, we really like it to apply in, in the forthcoming. Hello. <laughs> so, oh, much better. So, uh, by means of this investigation, and of course, they, uh, amongst the four partners, uh, the, well, the four partners are in, into academia somehow, and we really believe that academia is a good place to test things and uh, then bring back them to, to work and push forward discipline. Um, we started to, to think of three concepts that were here, like the ordinary, and there was the understanding the house as a system, and the other one, um, uh, the, the other one was um, thinking about uh, generic spaces or the house as a non-hierarchical space. So, uh, departing from these uh, three ideas contained in, in this investigation, we uh, start to think uh, of applying them in our work. So, when we won a competition of uh, the, uh, a building, a housing block that we just finished uh, one year ago, um, we wanted to, 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 to apply and um, introduce this idea of the house as a format of and of no hierarchical house. Of course, we had in mind these typologies of traditional domestic uh, housing blocks in Barcelona, which uh, most of them had these uh, same similar size rooms, and we wanted to apply it into our uh, project. And of course, we have tested this before, and in an exhibition we made uh, devoted to the book of George Breck, uh, Space Despace, where we created a set of generic rooms that would allow to become uh, that become specific precisely by means of the works of art and objects that were uh, set there by the curator. So when um, when we try to apply this into our project, um, of course the, the the demands of the client. Uh, had to do a lot with this. He wanted, he wanted a flexible structure that would allow to increase or decrease the size of the apartment uh, according to, to the changing needs. And of course, we wanted, uh, we wanted that all these, um, uh, of all these rooms uh, had not in a specific program, but the inhabitant would be the one that uh, would give it to them. And of course, we had in mind many of the floor plans that we have studied before. And this one is especially interesting. This is a really unspectacular floor plan. Uh, I would say almost without qualities, but at the same time, it's super radical. This is the San Remo, and it was uh, designed in a way that by means of simple doors, you could uh, enlarge the size of your apartment. So the, the building was not anymore a lot of stacked apartments, but uh, let's say a set of rooms that uh, made it a huge organism. And uh, this is the floor plan. So what we did was uh, creating similar size rooms that allow to be like reconfigured and so on. They are pretty small, like 53 square meters, but they look pretty pretty big since they, they have this diagonal and the position of the bathrooms is essential in this. Of course, the, we made this, this set of collage uh, trying to represent this idea of uh, how objects can give the specificity to these generic spaces. And these are some pictures. We like, we like, we really like them, and we like those of the, uh, on the right side because they are so boring. I mean, you look one, one, one by one, they are boring, but when you look to them as a whole, they start to work. Of course, uh, we always create these kind of rules for for the parts of the building. So, uh, for the floor plan, as I said, the rooms, and here we just reinterpret the tradition and got some of the. Uh, let's say cliches that were used during the 60s and 70s even with the materials. So we use them in the floor plan. And of course in the facade, we did exactly the same. We tried to make the most archetypical generic facade of the Champla. Uh, 
I think we succeed because a lot of people think it's a refurbishment. <laughs> and, yeah, that's not the first time somebody tells it. And we are really happy when that happens. So um, I could describe all the parts of this building according to a set of guidelines or a set of rules. And in fact, uh, every time we uh, end a project, what we do is uh, drawing it, and after we try to describe the rules or the guidelines that we used to uh, make it possible, uh, maybe it's a desire to make it kind of repli replicable. replicable. Uh, and if we had to make this exercise for an hour, for our hour, sorry our for our our own practice uh i think there would be two rules and there would be make some rules break some rules and always read carefully to the footnotes thank you okay well thank you for these excellent presentations uh i will go right to the point i propose three topics of discussion uh, the first one is, uh, in your work, it seems to be a great violence, in a way, between being super engaged and not being engaged at all. So uh, I think that could be your first topic to discuss. All of you are referring to very particular urban situations that are very critical, and at the same time, your work could be seen as engaged in some moments, also as playful and disengaged in other moments. So this is the first thing. The second, I think, uh, it's occupying space. All of you are kind of, your uh, presentations are really, could be read as struggles or f battles to occupy space. In that respect, that space is different. Uh, your space is maybe the space of uh, the city, the housing crisis. Uh, your space is also the space of media and even market. In your case, uh, it's uh, also even the, the space of your office. And the third question that I propose is more intimate, and it's very directly connected to what this, uh, this long day is discussing, that is the production of your own practice, the making of uh, your own through design. And I think this is, uh, uh, this, this, I mean, your three presentations were really good at that. You were explaining how you get constructed. And what is important for me is that you were explaining that space where you're kind of emerging uh, as practitioners very differently. For instance, uh, uh, Laurel, in your, in your case, is very much the, the narration and the storytelling and how that can be activated from objects, media, and how that circulates. In your case, is, uh, uh, is a crisis, housing crisis that is happening in certain places in Europe where you found the possibility of producing and constructing your practice. And in your case, it's a uh, kind of a financial crisis uh, that you address through the transformation of a space that became the hub of a network of collaborations. So three, three questions are the ones that I'd like to start with. Uh, the first one, uh, the tension between being super engaged and being not engaged at all. The second one, it's uh, what is that that you do uh, to occupy space and why occupying space is so important. The third one, the different strategies that you're deploying to, uh, and the, what is that that you're detecting as an opportunity, as a space, to emerge as a practitioner? So who wants to start? <laughs> uh, I'll start by the first one. The second yeah. one I cannot even remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will, yeah, I will, uh, well, I would like to think of myself as engaged, but I, I also, also have to say that there's a, there's a lot of complexity in things, and for instance, uh, when I see Michael Asher works, I think they are not engaged at all, but at the same time they are super political in the sense that he renders visible relationships that were hidden behind. So for instance, when we did, did this, this square, which was kind of controversial, um, you could read it just as a, let's say, uh, autonomous exercise of doing a kind of grid, but at the same time, uh, it was about uh, Provo pro provocating kind of reaction, and, and, it, and it happened somehow. So, of course, uh, citizens started to claim for more things. They realized that the budget was not enough or for what they expected, at least. So, um, architecture was a kind of a, could boost a reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, not, it was political in the sense that they could make it makes some things happen instead of saying ideologically what you have to do. And that's part of our statement that 
politics are there, but you can use them uh, in a way or in another one. It's funny, I, I think in preparation for coming to today, I probably made four different presentations because the premise of presenting the practice as opposed to the projects was a kind of existential crisis in and of itself. Um, you guys are laughing, so hopefully you made a few other ones. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, one of those presentations was a very straightforward sort of chronological buildup mm. of I went to school in this place, I was interested in these ideas, I worked for these people, I, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and, that, and all of that, I think, is very kind of important in certain ways um, mm -hmm. and has historically been important to sort of the legacy of architecture as a kind of discipline. Mm -hmm. But I also found in, in kind of the, in your, towards your question of being engaged or, or disengaged, that, um, that it seems like most of our practices have come out of a certain period of, of time, which is the sort of 2000, a 2009 economic crisis, um, which either you know um, caused us to react to that in certain ways, and so for me, working in Los Angeles, there is a very kind of heavy legacy of of architecture in Los Angeles, um, the the kind of history of. California modernism, et cetera, there, and, and then you, know, you move through the decades as you get uh, closer to this time, the, that legacy kind of continues. Um, but when I started my practice, because of the, because of the recession, so participating in that legacy was not necessarily an option. And so I had to both sort of construct a new way to imagine how to um, how to kind of produce design and, and architecture work. And I think that is the kind of tension where it's both mm -hmm. connected to, to a kind of larger legacy and context and also not connected. And I think there's also parts of, parts of um, my work that connect to other, other aspects of the context of Los Angeles that are not necessarily typically part of the kind of architectural context. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say a few words about, uh, I don't remember the three either, but I remember you spoke about taking up space. And uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> relating to that, I think, um, we do take up space in our drawings, but we, in a way we take up very little space because uh, very little of what we actually design or draw ourselves is being built. I mean, we, we put in the conditions for other people to, to build in the end, dealing with urban planning. For example, what we showed in Bordeaux, it's a five-year work, we still do it, and, and it's uh, in the end to facilitate uh, other people mm -hmm. to come in and build. Uh, so I don't think we take up space, but we do love space. Um, mm -hmm. We do because we really, and that's a strong belief, and that's in uh, speaking of feeling engaged, we do believe very strongly that physical structures mm -hmm. um, matter. Uh, and that they have an influence on the way we interact and the way we... And coming from France, which is a, a country where um, it's not good to be simple, it's not good to you, mm -hmm. have a complex thought in France, you know, speaking mm -hmm. about space is sometimes considered a little bit too simplistic. We don't use the word design a lot in France. It's almost, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's something you use in English-speaking countries. It's almost <laughs> vulgar sometimes. No, but it's true. But it's, <laughs> it is. You know, we have Philip yeah. Stark, but that's... Uh, yeah. uh, and for us, it's... Um, um, this simple aspect of physical structure is very yeah. important. I mean, even just going from... Yesterday we were in Paris, we arrived in New York. You are not in the same state of mind. And it is not just because of the shops, because they're the same in both countries. Yeah. In a way, it's also about the physical structure of the city. And this matters to us. And, and this mm -hmm. is something that we, uh, we believe in and that we, we want to push in. And, uh, and at the same time, we... Um, we do live in an apartment, in a space, and, and also this relates to us. So I think the, the issues that we push, they are both related to 
an economical situation for sure. Yeah. Uh, housing crisis, um, something that even being from our background, which is, uh, you know, we are not, we don't live in the street, but we have a lot of friends who have uh, difficulties finding housing, and so it's a, yeah. an issue that we are connected to. Um, so it's both being in that situation, but also strong convictions that we have because we relate to them physically, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to previous uh, panels, uh, the way uh, Los Angeles, uh, Paris, uh, Barcelona emerge as part of the conversation is not through uh, vernacular, not that much, or maybe uh, a little bit, but not that much. It's not about kind of um, colonial feelings or the discussion of colonial feelings that uh, divides. It's rather specific and regarding to architectural issues like uh, the housing crisis, the adjustments in walls. The, so I, I wonder if that's a, a little bit of a statement here that you are making as a group of, or as a panelist or as a panel, or is something that you would like to discuss? I mean, we could have seen, for instance, Gaudi images and how that's a reference to you. We could see, you know, like, yeah, but there's less of that here, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a tricky question because, of course, we, we look to the past, but uh, we're not taking past as something for granted. No? I mean, we take the things that they interest to us and we re reject those which are not interesting anymore. So I don't know if we, I would make a statement about that, <laughs> personally. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to... to, to, to um, answer and it has to do still with the third question you did and somehow I connect with this one is uh, thinking of our practice and maybe it has to do with the, with the references too but uh, since we're four and since we understand there's, there's a complicated relationship with authorship so mm -hmm. it's kind of erased when you start the dialogue with other people so this Gaudi thing would, would not happen in Maya because somebody would remove these uh, <laughs> uh, trencadis or whatever so yeah. um, we just get to the nuclear things, and because of, I think it works because it's also a format, and a format is uh, a set of rules that is an open structure that allows a lot of people uh, to participate and involve them uh, yeah. th through some guidelines. So it's more about the format than about uh, the content sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think for me, um, in, in an odd way, Los Angeles is something that one has to get out from underneath of um, <laughs> in, in terms of its um, history of, of modernism. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as, a, as an architect and designer, it, it's, um, it's, we're not fighting against a kind of uh, colonial system mm -hmm. or um, there isn't a kind of um, mater necessarily material history, but but there is a sense of tr of trying to get out from underneath a kind mm -hmm. of idea about what it is to to be in Los Angeles at the same time as to play kind of play with it and and play against it. <laughs> Maybe, again, I'm not sure if I really understood the question, but if we <laughs> did, uh, <laughs> I would say it's, it's not a statement, not at all. Yeah. It's, um, again, I think, it, and I think it's, and thank you again for inviting us because it's a very interesting day to see all these presentations. And I think what it um, tells us also is that um, we have an approach. Today we live in a world where you're supposed to multitask, do everything, yeah. change jobs every five months, be able to do, you know, a lot of different things. And, and, and the best way to work today is being a generalist uh, instead mm -hmm. of being a specialist. And I think what we feel and what I also read from other practices today is in a way we are choosing to be a specialist in, in, yeah. in what we do. And it's not because we believe it's the only issue, but it's because we feel that this is the issue that we engage in and it's the one we're good at. For example, we don't do, um, we don't design public spaces, we don't build public spaces. It's not because we don't have an interest in it, we do, uh, but we feel we're less good in it than other practices and so there might as well be other people who do that and and I think the, the structures, the physical structures that we design in terms of urban planning, they can accommodate 
a variety of, of kind of urban, of architectural uh, typologies and, and there can be vernacular elements mm -hmm. within that definitely and, uh, and we would even feel happy when they are, I think. But it's more choosing um, to work in a certain uh, field where we feel that we can push this specificity and be good at it. And also because, I mean, for us, we are a small office and, uh, and we also would like to remain a small office yeah. because it's a whole other way of working and so you cannot do everything. But this is super interesting because in a way France for a while and the uh, Central European uh, architectural context were reclaiming to uh, review and to rethink the, the role of the expert and to open uh, the decision making uh, of design to, to other actors. It's very interesting that you're claiming and you're, you're uh, following a very precise uh, a political agenda that is very different to the one that we would find in the 60s. Uh, whereas uh, at that moment being political was opening the design process to other actors, what you're reclaiming is that there's a specific way of dealing with politics from the discipline, from a very expert knowledge. This is a very unique situation that probably is confront a dispute in uh, previous generations in your context. Do you feel it like this way? <laughs> um, you know, being no, political in the past no. for a designer was uh, to make a model so other people could, so yes. users could transform things. You're no, reclaiming I, a very difficult uh, I different think it's, political it's stance. It's definitely a little bit of a, a reaction to that, but just a little bit. Not, I yeah. mean, I, th I don't think we close, what we're saying is not that we close the, uh, the decision process to our discipline, not at yeah. all, but that we push in a certain way of the subject. But that being said, it's true that today there is, and it has been for several years in France and in Europe in general, there, uh, the, the urban profession is opening up participatory processes, etc., mm -hmm. uh, which is very good. But sometimes the, the reality is that there is very little behind that. It's a lot of communication, and we're gonna and we design. We didn't show any of that today, but we work with uh, urban renewal projects, for example, where we work on site with the people, etc. And it's very good when it's really done. But a lot of times today. It's it's also a, a matter of communication. And it's also a way for the state almost to disengage in its responsibility uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of practices are emerging today, working with the inhabitants, building things from within where there are huge structural issues to be taken care of in these neighborhoods and the state is completely disengaging. And so it's also for us a way to say there is a, um, I mean, the housing crisis is something that can be not be left only to the developers, uh, and uh, the state needs to be responsible in that profession, and also the, our profession needs to take its responsibilities, I think, in, mm -hmm. that, in that field. I'd like to talk now about media, because both of you have been very engaged on media, basically. Uh, you've been doing quaderns, that has a great tradition, and many of the the research of Kitchenless is also something that was uh, uh, broadcasted to the media. Uh, you've been, your work is uh, uh, occupying the media, hackering the media, and introducing images in the media. Actually, the Doodle Project, the beautiful Doodle Project, is uh, getting to the front page of uh, our paper. So, uh, uh, but the, the two studies are very different. Yours is, in a way, quite direct. Uh, uh, you're doing a research stance uh, or a statement and that is uh, kind of published and you control that. You're kind of hackering uh, these systems. Actually, it expands even to urban mm -hmm. and you're and everything's packaged with sense of humor and kind of cute, uh, or cuteness. Uh, so I'd like you to explain uh, uh, why you're doing this, if you, if you can, and what, what is the way that this happened? <laughs> <laughs> uh, regarding uh, our relationship with quaterns, uh, th and that's really specific. Well, it's not the whole relationship we have with media, but yeah. quaterns uh, is a very special uh, thing in our wars because now it's over. But it was a really special thing in the office, and it makes us uh, think about uh, what it means to publish architecture or how architecture should be shown uh, today and. We realize that there are a lot of things going on and a lot of, lot of images, so the editor has become a kind of creator of content. So yeah. you have this immense reality and uh, this huge amount of information, and then you have to try to select in order to make a narrative. Of mm -hmm. course, it's just one narrative. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, that depends on who looks at it. I think for me, um, my, my interest in media <laughs> and the, the way I try to engage my work in me in media um, is is an interest 
um, an audience. And I think it came out for me um, as, a, as a student of architecture in feeling like there was not really an audience for mm -hmm. architecture or that the, the kind of ways that we were being taught architecture and sort of the, dis the kind of disciplinary conversations of architecture never got outside themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I became kind of interested in this, uh, in this idea that um, you could have this kind of disciplinary or avant-garde conversation that was supported by a kind of institution but that never, there was never a, a way for that conversation to get outside of the institution because it was almost like the, um, once you were supported by an institution, the conversation was kind of too big to fail. Mm -hmm. Like the, the sort of avant-garde project was in some ways too big to fail. And so I, got, I um, became kind of interested in trying to use media and images and storytelling in my work as a way to, to speak to an audience sort of outside, I think, where I originated, which was in an architecture mm -hmm. school and working for kind of small boutique architecture practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would say that's, that's really the kind of origin, mm -hmm. origin of it. And there are times where um, it, in some ways, my natural predilection would be something more like a, a kind of scholarly um, journal. And I, I, and I actually sort of like to force myself into a space where I'm confronted with, uh, with um, addressing a, a kind of much broader audience for my design work. <laughs> Probably there's already questions. Okay, please. <laughs> one here, one there. Yeah. First of all, I, uh, thank you for the presentations. I love all of your work. Um, I, I think uh, what struck me in terms of you know the, uh, the a quick comparison between what happened earlier in the morning and what's happening in your panel, uh, I would say is color uh, and maybe color and material, <laughs> color, color and materiality. Uh, if, we're, if we were to say that you know the previous uh, projects, uh, in, in contrast, uh, accented materiality, I think in, in all of your work, color is extremely important. And uh, it's just, I, I, I tend to think that maybe color represents something immaterial. Uh, so for instance, when you have a flag uh, of a country that represents uh, the identity of, a, of an individual or a collection of in individuals, uh, you know, the, the choice of color from RGB to, uh, I think Laurel's work is uh, closer to CMYK. And in the Studio Mayo, I think there's always a dash of white added to uh, a red that becomes pink, for instance. And I, I'm super curious about uh, what the, whether this becomes a kind of uh, representation of your attitudes or, or so. <laughs> then I start again. <laughs> Uh, for us, uh, the use of color is a kind of a statement. I mean, uh, in Barcelona, we were taught in a school that uh, was praising for materiality and for explaining how things work, and we're not interested in that at all. We prefer a more conceptual uh, approach to things. And of course, color is cheap, so <laughs> that's a good point for us in the kind of projects we do, and it kind of gives it identity by means of a very simple thing. So, uh, and again, this, this idea of format, the format for us, uh, can get a lot of formalizations. So it's different format to form. And uh, that has to do also with, with this idea of color. We could paint it whatever, we don't really care about this final thing, but about what's behind that, this kind of reflection behind it. I think for me, the color, in some ways, originally the color was, um, reactionary to the um, to the offices that I had worked in where things were primarily white, except for a couple of cases. Um, there was a kind of emphasis on whiteness and that the white would emphasize the form better than say color. And so I think, <laughs> so I think originally it was just a, a total reaction where I was like, no, I'm just gonna, everything is gonna be colored. Um, 
it was, and it's sort of simple in that <laughs> simple in that way, and it, and the use of color has a has kind of evolved it to the point where there is, I think, in some ways, like you guys, there's a co a color palette that gets used, you know, sort of over and over and over again. Um, but it's not. I think what was super interesting about your presentation was how indexical the use of color was as a kind of way of practice, which yeah. I thought I found super yeah. interesting. Yeah. First of all, um, we, we like colors, it's true. And uh, <laughs> it's something quite natural for us to say that the housing is red. It cannot be something else for us. Uh, maybe during the night it's uh, um, pink or something like, like that. But um, when we work on an architectural project, we draw in black and white, like everybody, because every in this field, everybody can understand this kind of plan. But in an uh, urban... Um, uh, or urban planning, it's um, sometimes we have difficulties also to represent uh, um, um, the scale and yeah. uh, to represent the, the, the uh, I don't know, but uh, an ocean on the A4. It's something that we have to um, we have to deal with abstraction. It doesn't yeah. mean that the, the form is not it's uh, abstract, but um, uh, we we like this exercise not in an aesthetic way, but really to. Uh, be precise on what we want to say, mm -hmm. and for us, it's um, yeah, it's really a way to um, to um, be able to zoom in and zoom out, uh, mm -hmm. and the use of color is like that. It's like that, and we learn also from a graphic designer uh, mm -hmm. because uh, graphic designer also are are really related to the painter, yeah. and uh, for example, Paul Rand, which is an American designer, he always talk about the the. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Matisse, I don't know, Cezanne, and uh, for us it's something not, uh, and in, it's true that in France, the um, graphic design, it's not related to architecture. It's really two world completely, and we like the, the idea that the design and color, it's something uh, um, uh, that we, it helps us to work, it's true, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. Uh, thank you all for uh, the presentations, and I'm just uh, trying to find uh, what I kind of saw as a common thread between all the practices was maybe how personal it was to all of you, how related to um, you as people, and kind of the way you're constructing a practice as a project in itself. You're, the work that you're doing is you're designing the practice by picking the products you want to work with. And for example, with Mayo, it's the office, it's the rules with the, for welcome products, the umbrella. And I was kind of interested in how in all of these projects there was an operation of scaling up or down and how it seemed to me that this operation tests what you guys hold as values or what your theories and your rules are. It always sort of forces you guys to maybe amend the rules or change the way you're approaching things. And I was curious of what you think, like that act of scaling things up, for example, from home to city and from <coughs> sort of like the rules, how these things change in terms of scale and how they affect what you thought before and what you want to do next. <laughs> Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yes, of course. Um, rules, as I said in these two final statements, that you make some rules, then you break some rules. Of course, rules are, are always related to a previous uh, reading of reality. So uh, there's a kind of dialogue in, in defining these rules among us as partners. So it's you try to, to, to get all this complexity and transform it into a kind of a system that can be at the, at the same time transforming into a form or into a architecture or something. So rules are not like universal, but they're really particular. And uh, for, of course for housing, we, we find a set of rules that are quite different. Of course, you can find some um, analogies among our works, and of course there are, because they have to, sometimes they reflect on this idea of uh, isotropy or the way how you are finally occupy spy, <coughs> occupy the space. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors and the inhabitants of the citizens, I don't know. So we just set the uh, conditions for something to have, for, for the things to happen. That, that would be the, 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 the thing they have in common, I guess. I think for me, the, the, the issue of scale, there's a kind of multiplicity for the, to the issue of scale, both because I have an interest in 
design as something that scales so that <laughs> you can uh, that you can design a kind of system of things that that mm -hmm. scale um, but I think originally the sort of small scale of the object that um, we started to work at was out of a kind of necessity which is that I needed to to have something that I could a, a scale at which I could work and produce and be in control of and afford um, as, a, <laughs> as a definite part of it um, and and then you know the pr project scale scale up and down um, I'm very interested in kind of the scale of of the city albeit at this point it is purely out of a kind of speculative it is a speculative interest um, but I was also what I was also really not interested in when I started was I wasn't interested in doing um, speculation in terms of sort of competitions which was why I started at a kind of scale of the object being that something that we could literally pr produce mm -hmm. okay so amazing panel <laughs> let's go on <laughs>